more valuable than ten pounds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome to the meeting and the talk with Gavin Esler. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here in the room, but I'd also like to welcome you out there across the country in various places. I know in Oxford, I know in Northeast and various other locations that you are in. Um, it's a, to say the usual cliched phrase, it's a great honor to be in the same room and to listen to Gavin Esther, I think would be a complete understatement. And as I said, it's a cliche. I think it is fantastic that we've got Gavin Esler and that he's actually found time to come along and to speak us, to us about his book, How Britain Ends, but also to go into a question and answer session afterwards. Uh, bearing that in mind, the question and answer, uh, I say to those online, please, please, please write the word question in front of your question. I attend a lot of Zoom meetings and often it's hard in to see which is the question in the chat. To those here in the room, we will take it in turns depending on the number of questions. And I know that Gavin said he enjoys the question and answer because he likes relating to people. Being a journalist, uh, a good one, an exceptional one like Gavin, um, would suggest something about the actual journalist. It would suggest that that person has an understanding and an empathy for the person whom they are interviewing. And uh, because the better you are, the better you will ask the questions. And I think Gavin, as we all know, through BBC Two Newsnight and through various other occasions, <coughs> And he then doesn't just sit there with all that knowledge. He actually writes books about it. He's written novels. He's written um, uh, factual books. Uh, the book written before this one was also uh, a very uh, well-known one. Um, and I can recommend that to you now. Less of me, more of Gavin. So I hand over to Gavin Esther. Uh, hello to everyone watching uh, at home or wherever you are. Um, it's very good to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about the divisions in our country that produce Brexit and the divisions in our country caused by Brexit. But if you take nothing away from this meeting, let me just give you two quick thoughts. One, Brexit is not done. And secondly, Brexit divides us and continues to divide us and was a symbol of our division. So I've personally always been, always thought of myself as Scottish and British and European. Uh, I'm a, I lived in London for a long time. I'm a Londoner too. And I can't understand why people don't stand to the right in, in the tube when they're going uh, <laughs> down the escalators. And I live in Kent and uh, I love it. I love the Kent coast. I was at university here, uh, university at two English universities. <coughs> And so I have lived in each of the parts of the United Kingdom, Scotland, where I was born, Northern Ireland, where I was a journalist for some years, and Wales for only about six months, and England for much of my life. And I've never really thought about these levels of my identity. I mean, um, I wear the kilt sometimes when I, I went to a friend's Scottish wedding feast in London. Uh, my wife couldn't attend, and she said to me, you're not wearing the kilt on the tube, are you? <laughs> and I said, yes. I mean, this is the most sophisticated city in the world. What could possibly go wrong? Um, and so I was standing at the North London tube station, six o'clock on a Saturday night, wearing full Highland regalia, going to my friend's wedding feast, when a man came up and stood right in front of me. And he did this. <laughs> Jeremy Paxman, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have never been so insulted. <laughs> now, um, uh, despite those sort of layers of my identity, I, um, I thought the 2015 general election was a watershed in many ways. And one of the reasons it was a watershed was the four constituent parts of the United Kingdom 
all voted for a different major party. In Scotland, it was the SNP and still is. In Northern Ireland, it was the DUP and still is, although it might be Sinn Féin. Again, two parties that you don't find in England. In Wales, it was the Labour Party, and still is, the biggest party in Wales. In England, 84% of the population of the United Kingdom, the elephant in the bed, as uh, the writer Ludovic Kennedy once said, the, the elephant in the bed of the Union, voted for the Conservatives, and we got a Conservative government. But those four different parts of the UK, the tectonic plates, we're moving different directions, but we've got a two-party system. So that seemed a bit odd. The other thing that was a bit odd about that election is that UKIP got 3.8 million votes. Now, this is not a, a group that I suspect there are many UKIP voters who've been disenfranchised, but there is something very odd about a democratic system that claims to be a democracy that talks about the mother of parliaments when 3.8 million of our fellow citizens, most of them in England, got nothing. Well, they got Douglas Carswell, who then quit the party. Uh, so they did get nothing. So just hold that thought in your mind. There's something about the divisions that were already there. This is before the Brexit vote. Um, and then um, I started to think about what it was to be British in the 21st century. What held us together? Linda Colley, great English historian, says that Britishness historically is Protestantism, empire, and war. Protestantism, less salient than it, than it once was. Uh, empire, of course, the empire has gone. War, I'm not sure about Putin, but it has tended to recede in our national consciousness. And you see the Protestantism, empire, and war sometimes in Northern Ireland, in the the marching season, but do those things matter so much to people quite the way they did? When the, um, the Union of the United Kingdom came about in different, different names of different guises, it came about when James VI of Scotland became James I, as we all know, we're all taught this at school. And James I said, we have thought good to discontinue the divided names of England and Scotland and resolve to take the name and style of the king of Great Britain. We, the British, stood together, usually against foreign foes. For a long time, it was against Catholic Europe. Uh, and then it was, of course, against the French, right up until 1815. And then there was a long period where we didn't have to cohere against anyone until the 20th century, uh, standing up against Germany, and finally against the Soviet Union uh, through the Cold War. One of my heroes from this period is somebody who's not often remembered these days, but he's a man called Arthur Greenwood. And Arthur Greenwood in 1939 was deputy, Labour, uh, deputy leader of the Labour Party. And in September 1939, when Nazi troops were pouring into Poland, and no doubt at the time they called it a special military operation, not an invasion, <laughs> because there are certain echoes that we see. When that happened, there was a debate in Parliament. And uh, Arthur Greenwood stood up to talk on behalf of the Labour Party. Leo Amory, a very right-wing conservative, on the other benches, the government benches, called out, speak for England, Arthur. And Arthur did. And he said this was unacceptable and we had to go to war. We couldn't stand by. But he spoke not just for England. He spoke for Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland as well. He spoke for the British Empire, he spoke for decent people actually around the world. And I started to think after 2015, who is there who speaks for all of us now? Who is there credibly in England in particular who speaks for the union of the United Kingdom? I mean, we hear the words occasionally, but do we really believe them? Where is the Churchill, the Margaret Thatcher, the Gordon Brown, uh, who clearly attempted to speak for the whole of the United Kingdom. And this is not about Labour and the Conservatives. This is about an idea of who we are as a people. And then, of course, we had um, Brexit. And Brexit is very interesting in a number of ways. I mean, one is it always reminds me of um, that great line in Macbeth, if we're done when it is done, then we're well, it were done quickly. But it's not done because otherwise we wouldn't be renegotiating it constantly and constantly blaming 
the Europeans for the deal that Lord Frost so brilliantly conceived, and which he, as I'm sure this room knows, described as excellent. <laughs> and he now he doesn't use the word, but I assume he now thinks it's excellent. But anyway, um, it's, a, it's the same deal. And when I think about those lines from Macbeth, I always think that was the beginning of the tragedy. It wasn't the end. Um, and we are not by any means at the end of Brexit. So after the Brexit vote, two specific events got me to write how Britain ends, because I could see the tectonic plates of our union were shifting. And I could see that the differences in the Brexit vote, which we all know about, you know, Scotland, Northern Ireland voted to remain, uh, England voted to leave. Wales also voted to leave, but there's some interesting work by Professor Danny Dorling from Cambridge University, which suggests that if you factored out those English people who had retired to Wales, then actually Wales would have voted to remain. I don't know if it's his, his work, not mine, but it's interesting. But those two specific events in 2019 that made me think about writing the book started in Edinburgh, uh, which is where I mostly grew up, and at the book festival. And at the book festival that year, I met a lot of old friends and people I'd known for years in this very small C conservative city. Edinburgh is a very conservative place. Uh, and most of the people I knew had voted against independence for various reasons. And one of them was really outraged by Brexit, by the Brexit vote, because two thirds of Scottish people voted to remain. Every electoral district in Scotland voted to remain. My friend said, I'm Scottish and British and European, but now those, I'm going to use the word politicians, but he used a different word, but I don't want to use <laughs> the, the, the correct word, the word he actually said here. I'm Scottish and British and European, but now those politicians are taking away one level of my identity as Europeans. I'm going to reconsider the other level, which was the Britishness. And I was quite shocked by that because he is a small C conservative kind of guy. Um, another one said to me, Brexit is like an old joke. An Englishman, Scotsman, and Irishman go into a pub. The Englishman wants to go home, so we all have to leave. <laughs> and when I argued back that Boris Johnson says he's a one-nation conservative, I was told, well, the one nation is not the United Kingdom. It must be England because it's not us. Now, that's one of the reasons why, I mean, there are other reasons too, but that's one of the reasons whether, whether you're against or, or, or in favour of Scottish independence, that is not going to go away. And something similar happened two or three months later when I went to Northern Ireland. Um, I, 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 can, I can tell you in this room that, uh, say it in the book, that the Esslers were German Protestants who uh, moved to Scotland during the Thirty Years' War in Germany. So we were immigrants. And we, some of our family moved to Northern Ireland about 100 years after the plantation of Ulster and got land in County Antrim. So they're Protestants and Unionists. And 12 members of my family vote, uh, signed the Ulster Covenant of 1912 to remain within the United Kingdom. So I know Ulster loyalism uh, very well. I know many people who are Unionists. I visited Northern Ireland about uh, three days, four days after uh, Boris Johnson met Leo Varadkar, the Prime Minister of Ireland, um, at the Wirral, and essentially, according to one of my friends there in Northern Ireland, threw a hundred years of Ulster Unionism into the Irish Sea. Because the border, which had been, as we all know, such a point of contention for a hundred years, Mr Johnson said at one point, it's no more significant than the border between Camden and Westminster. I beg to differ. Yeah. More than 3,000 people died in horrible circumstances, either to preserve that border or to get rid of it. Um, this moment was really quite profound to some of my friends in Northern Ireland. One of them said to me, um, Mrs. Thatcher used to say that uh, Northern Ireland is as British as Finchley, Boris Johnson has made it as British as France. Now, I've been back to Northern Ireland quite a few times since, since then, and I was there uh, just before Christmas, and I was talking to what we will call politely um, former combatants in, in Northern Ireland. In the Protestant side, uh, in West Belfast, I said to some of them, you know, the deal that Northern Ireland got 
from in terms of access to the European Union markets is something people in Scotland might actually quite like, something that Welsh hill farmers might quite like, English cheese producers might like. And they said, yes, but it makes us feel different. We are not being treated the same way as England, Scotland and Wales. And that is why the problems in Northern Ireland unfortunately continue. The subtitle of the book is uh, English nationalism and, and the, the future of these four nations. I just wanted to say a quick word about that because within, let me put it this way, since we're uh, still talking about Northern Ireland, Ian Paisley Jr., who everybody here knows is a very famous name and a very famous father, the, the kind of creator of the Democratic Unionist Party of the Free Presbyterian Church, a real firebrand preacher who brought unionists into the power sharing agreement. It was quite remarkable, really was remarkable. And, and we seem to have forgotten. I mean, we we're all shocked by uh, the murder of, um, of Mr. Ames in Southend. But do we not remember Anthony Berry, who was blown up and Mrs. Thatcher was almost killed? Do we all not remember the Reverend Robert Bradford, another MP who was murdered, or Ian Gow, or Airy Neve? Now that doesn't happen anymore because the troubles in Northern Ireland, which lasted for 30 years in that most recent incarnation, passed into history because the border was no longer a problem. It was kind of Schrodinger's border. You know, if you felt you needed it, it was there on the map, but if you didn't need it, you could just travel across it. It changed things completely. And Brexit has blown that sideways. And Northern Ireland was never, I, 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 listened to many and interviewed many politicians in 2016 about the Brexit vote. Nobody mentioned Northern Ireland. Nobody mentioned the border. Ian Paisley Jr. said recently in the House of Commons that, uh, let, me, let me see if I can find the, 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 the correct quote, because it's very, very interesting coming from him. He said that, uh, I don't know if I've got it, I've got it here. But he said that he feared that the Conservative Party of Boris Johnson was no longer a unionist party, but it was an English nationalist party, yeah. mm -hmm. which did not think about the union of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree with that sentiment. I think he's right. And I think he's right. People in Northern Ireland who feel that they are unionists have a right to feel abandoned. The former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, so that's the DUP, another unionist, the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown said in January uh, last year, I believe the choice is now between a reformed state in the United <clears throat> Kingdom and a failed state because he's worried about the union. George Osborne in January 2021 said that, Conservative former Chancellor, said that Boris Johnson could go down in history as the worst British Prime Minister since the one who lost the American colonies in the 1770s, Lord North, because by unleashing English nationalism, this is, this is what uh, George Osborne says, by unleashing English nationalism, Brexit means Northern Ireland is already heading for the exit door of the UK. It may join with the Irish Republic. Scotland appears determined to follow with profound results for England. The rest of the world would instantly see that we, Mr. Uh, Mr. Osborne means England, we're no longer a front line pack a front rank power, or even in the second row, we would instead be one of the great majority of countries who are on the receiving end of the decisions made by a few, subject to the values of others, we would become another historically interesting st case study in how successful nations can perform unexpected acts of national suicide. And since we've had a Northern Irishman, a Scotsman and an Englishman, let me end with a, a Welshman on this. This is Wales First Minister, a Labour politician, again a unionist, Mark Drakeford, speaking before the Parliamentary Welsh Affairs Committee. What we have to do is we have to recognise that the union as it is, is over. We have to create a new union. We have to demonstrate to people how we can recraft the UK in a way that recognises it as a voluntary association of four nations in which we choose to pool our sovereignty for common purposes and common benefits. Now, what's interesting about that is these unionists in England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales who care about the United Kingdom recognise we've got to change and that Brexit 
has caused great problems, existential problems, I would suggest. Now here, just to get somebody who captures the English nationalist view, let me um, quote Louis de Bernier. You know, Captain Corelli's mandolin? This is him writing in the Financial Times. The logic of Brexit, Brexit should take us further. It has been increasingly obvious to me and fellow leavers for years that the English would be better off on their own. It seems ever more obvious that Ireland can be reunited, reunified, because all the very good reasons for the North resisting this have gone. The Republic is no longer a corrupt backward country. It is an energetic, vibrant place where anyone would love to live, including me. And he then says, if Ireland were being strictly rational, it would also leave the EU and opt for an Anglo-Irish economic zone. Now, I can't tell you how irritated my <laughs> Irish friends are by the patronising attitude that somehow they're not being rational, especially since in 1973, when Britain joined the European Economic Community and Ireland did at the same time, Irish GDP per capita was about two thirds of ours. And it's now about, I think it's 25% higher than ours. So Ireland is doing very well. We, however, seem to be in some difficulty. So let me wrap up because I'd love to take some questions. Brexit was not the start of our divisions, but it was a symptom of it. We have <clears throat> profound problems now in trying to figure out how, if it's possible, to at least ameliorate it, if not reverse it. But we're not helped by the fact that there is no Arthur Greenwood today in England that I can think of. Maybe, maybe you can. There are people, of course, who care about the union of the United Kingdom, but there is nobody making that case. And far from making that case, we have in the Johnson administration arch condescension towards the Irish Republic, towards the politicians in Northern Ireland, some of them I very much disagree with, even to their own conservative colleagues in Scotland. When Douglas Ross suggested, the Conservative leader in Scotland suggested that Boris Johnson was unfit to lead his party and our country, Jacob Rees-Mogg said he was a lightweight. Mm. Now, to be called a lightweight, lightweight by Jacob Rees-Mogg is really pushing it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
But one of the things that really strikes me as very odd is every person in this room, and in fact, every person in every audience that I've ever talked to up and down this country in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. learns that at the end of World War I, Germany, because it lost, lost a huge amount of territory, it actually lost 13% of its territory. This was swinging. Nobody in our country ever learns how much territory did the United Kingdom lose at the end of World War I. It was the 26 counties of Ireland, and it was 22% of what had been, then been the United Kingdom. Largely it was a result of complacency and muddling. <clears throat> Extrapolate from that to 2022, I hear the Louis de Bernay of you and others, oh, let, let the Northern Ireland people go, <clears throat> get rid of them, or let Scotland go. They'll, they'll, they'll really regret it, it'd be terrible for them. Well, there are all kinds of challenges about Scottish independence. I'm not advocating it, I'm just like go through some of them. But nobody ever in our country talks about the challenges for England if Scotland were independent. Mm -hmm. The first challenge would be that the United Kingdom, as currently constituted, would lose about a third of its landmass, 32%. The second challenge would be it would be 60% of our sea area, because the sea area from Scotland goes from Rockall to Shetland and then out to the, the North Sea. And remember all the fuss that we had about fish? Where do you think the fish are? <laughs> they don't have St George's Cross on them, nor would they have actually St Andrew's Cross. But you 60% of the sea area. We would also, in the United Kingdom, have to consider what we're going to do about Faslane and the nuclear um, the deterrent, which is there, which is one of the things that is occasionally mentioned. We would also have to manage a border somehow. Now, the border in Northern Ireland, between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic, the genius of the Good Friday Agreement was that the border ceased to matter for everybody, actually. What would we do about the border? And what would we do about the United Kingdom's permanent five membership of the um, UN Security Council? Because when the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia had to apply. Nobody objected. Russia, of course, took the Soviet Union seat at, on the Security Council. But would anybody object if England or England and Wales were to apply for the United Kingdom seat? Would France object? Would China? Would Russia? Would Joe Biden? We might find ourselves in a very tricky position. So I'm saying that because the Northern Ireland um, example is interesting because it's about muddling. It's about not thinking things through. Some people did, but it never actually achieved very much. Mm -hmm. And we are in a similar, it seems to me, kind of muddle about Brexit and about how to reorganize the different parts of the United Kingdom, and we haven't done it. No. Yes, gentlemen there. And then I'll get back. Thank you, Gavin. My name's Nicholas Blake. What worried me about the campaign for the European election was that nobody seemed to go for the people who were on the fence. Whenever you have an election, you don't want to campaign for the people who are on each extremes. You know they're going to vote for you or against you. Jeremy Corbyn had been up here voted against Europe in 1974 and he was meant to perform a task which I think could have been quite good like saying I've been very skeptical but on balance mm -hmm. I vote for Europe I mean I can recite all the things that are wrong with Europe as we all can but on balance I'm in favour of why I'm here tonight but Jeremy Corbyn could have helped persuade people who are a bit like him who were not entirely sure and the opinion polls were finally balanced all the way through but those of us who wanted to uh, remain to succeed believed we'd succeed because that's what we believed in. And we didn't actually go for the people in the middle. I don't know if you agree with that at all, but that's how I see it. Well, I, I think the people in the middle are actually, I think, most of the population on most things. Because one of the interesting things I've found, and I've, I've, I've been uh, doing public meetings in Belfast, in the West, and, you know, <coughs> top mess in all over Scotland and, and, and much of England, including Hexham in the North and Bradford and so on, is people disagree, but most people are A, not disagreeable, and B, are prepared to listen to others' arguments. And the problem, it seems, is, if I may say, even slightly bigger than, than you suggested, which is, 
we, we delude ourselves into thinking we have a two-party system because we have a first-past-the-post system of voting. And I looked uh, uh, at uh, which legislatures in Europe have a first-past-the-post system, and there are two. Westminster, not Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland for their partners, but the Westminster system, so largely England, and Belarus. <laughs> now, <laughs> I think that's a very uh, odd system, and it means, for example, that Scotland has not voted for a Conservative government since 1955, and if you look back in our history, there is no part, po political party since, I think, the 1930s that has won a majority of the seats with a majority of the votes. We had, of course, the coalition in 2010, which did have a majority of the votes because it was a coalition. And that in itself is instructive. So it seems to me the root, I mean, this is a long answer to, to your point, but it, I think your point is an excellent one, which is that we have this system which we have failed to reform. It is unfit, by which I mean the electoral system. It is unfit for the 21st century. It produces both for Labour under Tony Blair and for the Conservatives under Boris Johnson, thumping majorities with about 43% of the vote. And so therefore, the middle is always going to be squeezed. And our choice in the 2019 election was between Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn, largely, because many of the other votes, even if you added them up, and they were considerable, weren't going to get you anywhere. So uh, it's not surprising, it's not only that politicians tend not to focus on the middle, but that people get elected to, uh, to the, our parliament through party selection, which very often tends to push people to more extremes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, we, we, if, I'm sure everybody in this room has sometimes said to themselves, how do you become Chris Grayling? <laughs> how do you? Or, how, how, I mean, seriously, how do you become Chris Grayling? How do you, how do you go through a series of jobs and fail and continue to be promoted? And that's because the party, if you're loyal, and he was, he's not a bad person, but he wasn't particularly competent in any of his posts. I mean, the probation service and, you know, ferries and so on. And there are others I could mention, not just in the Conservative Party. And that's a flaw in our two-party system, supposed two-party system especially when Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland vote in different ways, and the north of England, quite rightly, often feels it too is not really taken into account by Westminster. Wrong answer, but anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some, there was a lady there, and... Uh, uh, could we just ask the one line one? Yeah, sure. Uh, there's a, a couple of these themes, so I'll, I'll put them to, together. Uh, Janet asked, first of all, uh, will Scotland become independent, and when? Uh, Martin asked uh, on a similar theme whether uh, Thatcher ceded the end of the union with disinterest in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And uh, Peter added a, a point here in a question, was saying if if we do lose Scotland, would that leave an unassailable Tory majority for the rest of the UK? So a, a lot to pack in. There, <laughs> a lot to pack in. But, uh, okay. Well, well, uh, 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 two two three things. I have no idea whether Scotland will be independent, but I know that the, the moves towards Scottish independence will not go away. And that, uh, I mean, George Osborne, who I quoted earlier, uh, uh, said in that same article where he fretted about the end of the union, he said, basically, the only way to stop Scotland becoming independent is to not, not let them vote on it, which I don't think is particularly democratic, even if you, you, you see those problems. Now, many Scots will continue to vote always think of themselves as British and will not vote for it. So it's going to be very difficult. And it's going to be very difficult for the SNP for another reason too. This idea that we have referendums is fraught with difficulty because you're settling a complex question, as we know with Brexit, uh, with, a, with a binary uh, answer. And if Scotland were to vote for 51%, 52% in favour of independence and 48% against, that would mean how do you bring 48% along? So it's difficult, but I think it could happen, and the question will, will not go away. And as, as, as for the future of England, I think the key thing that really strikes me is that England has lost out in devolution. Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland have, you know, Boris Johnson said, um, uh, well, I should say that when Boris Johnson goes to Scotland, uh, SNP people I know complain publicly, but are delighted. 
and uh, conservatives <laughs> are welcoming <coughs> and as one put it we die a little inside because they know he is not the Arthur Greenwood of our, our day um, so the, the the question of who can pull all these threads together in Scotland it isn't him uh, and it won't be him so for now, he is quite a vote winner, it seems to me, for both independence and the SNP, even though, even though we face a common threat from Russia and a common threat from coronavirus. The coronavirus one didn't particularly pull us together. Scotland went its own way too. So you can see that the, 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 the uh, Scotland took different decisions at different times, as did Northern Ireland and Wales. So the impulse for devolution remains and possibly for independence, but England remains one of the most centralised countries in Europe, unlike Sorry, France. Okay, just, just on that, um, talk about devolution, because Richard from Hertfordshire asked on that point, um, what would be the best way, in your opinion, to promote further devolution in the UK to help hold the union together? Well, I think, for, for me, the as I said, the biggest losers have been uh, in England. So it seems to me, I'm not suggesting a return to Wessex and, you know. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Although somebody did say to me, what about free Cornwall? But that's a, I mean, how you actually divide the cake is, is quite difficult because England is quite a, as we know, a very complex polity. But, but let's build on what we've got. There are great cities with mayors who are quite popular. Uh, there happens to be a Conservative mayor in Birmingham, there happens to be Andy, Andy Burnham in, in Ma Manchester, uh, 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 Liverpool's got a mayor, why not extend the mayoralties to other places? They, they remain popular, the idea of them remains popular, why don't we take decisions more locally? And also we have this idea um, that we're not already federalised by stealth, this is something I go into in the book, I mean we don't have, we don't have anything as, as sort of um, easy to understand as a written constitution or as Germany has a basic law so you can do us what we just muddle through but in that muddle we have you know there is no British education system the system of Scotland is completely different there are no British there is no British university system again the universities in Scotland are very different the, the legal system in Northern Ireland and Scotland is very different the BBC is is heavily devolved and will be more more and more devolved so why, if it's okay to do it in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, and I, don't, I think it's even better than okay, it's quite popular. I'm not saying that people like the administrations necessarily they've got, but they like the idea of local power, local people deciding local things. But in England, that has not been quite the case. And what we have had instead, particularly since 1979, is unfunded mandates for local councils, where councils get told to do more things but they don't get any more money for it. And we haven't really thought that through, and nor have we thought through exactly who does what. And that, that leads to all kinds of problems, as we saw when the prorogation of Parliament took place. Okay. Yes, Jeffrey. Uh, you talk about the, the different nations uh, in the island, uh, but uh, the, isn't there a, a new mode required of cooperation between them? Because uh, at the moment in England, uh, the majority in England is also the majority of the island altogether. Uh, and um, so there is uh, no real federal impulse there to, to cooperate between the various bits. Well, you, you're right in saying that uh, the majority in England becomes the majority in the United Kingdom, but that does not make it, uh, well, two, two parts by that. It does not make it the um, majority in Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland, which leads to some resentment. And secondly, it depends what you mean by the majority. It's the majority, you know, an 80 seat majority in Parliament on 43%, 0.6% of the vote is not a majority. It's a majority is in Parliament, but it's not a popular majority. And of course, many of us have turned off and don't vote as well now. It's, it's quite interesting, the loss of trust in the political system in general, which has been a factor of the last 20 years. A lot of people haven't voted. They do in Canterbury. A lot of students vote now in Canterbury, and they've been energised by the Students' Union and others. 
So it, it is, is very difficult. And, you know, it does seem to me, to go to the heart of your point, all the questions that we face, the real questions that we face of global warming, uh, or the question of uh, refugees, migration, uh, dodgy money coming out, uh, sloshing around, economic growth, trade, and so on, coronavirus, they're not national problems, they're international problems. So we do have to cooperate. But Britain, unfortunately, has decided that um, not only are we pulling out, have we pulled out of the European Union, but we're going to blame others for the the mess that we've got into as a result and you could see today in the uh, in the meeting the international meeting where our prime minister was standing there with his hands in his pockets because everybody else was glad by handing each other so the concept of global britain when um, unfortunately the british government seems to have irritated everyone from ireland to france to across the european union to joe biden plus of course russia china uh, all those countries whose aid that we've cut despite promising it and as we've seen today Jamaica is now saying that it no longer well, at least the Prime Minister of Jamaica is saying we don't want to be a monarchy anymore this is a very funny way to run something you call global Britain it seems to me <laughs> so I agree we have to cooperate but that is not the way in which the divisions caused by Brexit and our government have operated Lady, yeah I think Something I'm grappling with is that we talk a lot about politics. A lot of people I speak to on street schools, they don't care. They don't really understand it. We might. And I think a lot of the reason though B was about it was about identity. Mm -hmm. And Frank Fukuyama talks a lot about this, about the dignity, about being included, about being part of the story. I'm not English, I don't know if English, but very often the English story, I ask friends, what does it mean to you to be English? What does it mean to and the English nationalism always seemed to go about the past or about fighting someone. Mm -hmm. So how do you move to a modern England? What do you offer people? I mean, I went to the European Parliament. It's modern, it's light, it's circular. You go to the British Parliament, it's fusty and old, <laughs> and, and, and all the politicians went back to... It's confrontational. It's confrontational. Well. It's confrontational. It's it's so two swords lengths apart. How do you now? contact those people yeah. and say, you don't need to know about the minutiae and the technicalities? But what, what's the vision and what's the hope? Well, I, I, I agree absolutely with the premise of your question. In fact, in the book, I talk a lot about what I call nostalgic pessimism, yeah. which is the idea it was always better in the past, always, and it can only be worse in the future. This is, of course, utter nonsense. I mean, total nonsense. Or the generations in the past were better. And in fact, one of the things I, I do is um, uh, quote the... the great speech from from shakespeare about how this england this jewel in the sea and so on we're not up to it the same way as our forefathers were where that was written by shakespeare in 1595 so he had a touch of the nostalgic pessimism as, as well it is an interesting thread which runs through um english culture rather than british culture i think part of it is going to be and it may have to take even more shocks um unfortunately <coughs> Uh, to recognize it, which is think about what our place is in the world. Why is it part of our, I mean, I think you're right to say that, you know, most people, most of the time, perhaps don't have a lot of time to get involved in the minutiae of politics. What we have in our country and what the Americans had and with Donald Trump was somebody who writes headlines. Global Britain, uh, take our country back, you know, um, make America great again. There's no, there's no policy behind it. But there is tomorrow's headlines, and that is very attractive to, to some people. But it is interesting that it was take our country back, not take our country <laughs> forward. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, may only be interrupted with a series of shocks to remind people that things have changed, that the empire has gone, the majesty of the queen will not be there forever, there will be a, a, you know, a new monarch at some point, and the, the, even the Commonwealth, the structure of the Commonwealth will change, just as Britain's role in Europe has changed. And Peter Ricketts, Lord Ricketts, who's a former chief, uh, former national security advisor, um, I've appeared in a lot of um, panels with him. And one of the things Peter says, uh, I think is absolutely right, is that why is it people in Britain haven't recognized that our usefulness to the United States was based upon being in the European Union as a strong voice for, as Americans would tend to say, common sense. And once you lose the European pillar, you're not going to have 
what's sometimes called the Anglosphere pillar, because we are less important all round. Mm -hmm. Now, that shock has not really percolated through, but I think it will, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, on, on another point, um, Peter from uh, Oxford for Europe, uh, on a slightly different point to what we've been talking about, says, hi, Gavin, I wanted to ask a question about the opportunities of Brexit. Ask Reese Mogg. There are many, but alas, never the right people. One is the chance to go back to the medieval weights, uh, uh, units of weights and measures. As a patron of the UK Metric Association, we are honoured to have you. Uh, can you comment on this? I can, actually. I am a patron of the UK uh, uh, Metrics <laughs> Association. Uh, look, I, I don't know if you've seen this, but please Google it at home. It's great fun. Uh, if you want to help Jacob Reese Mogg, Google which countries around the world have the old British imperial uh, weights and measures uh, uh, in, in their country. And what comes up on the map are three other countries apart from the United Kingdom. One is the United States. Now, I can tell you, it does have things called gallons, but they're not the same. Yeah. Their weights and measures system isn't the same. And if you look at their even their military shells, they're sometimes... Um, calibrated in the metric system and sometimes calibrated in the sort of British imperial system, which is the American system and is not quite the same. So there it is. It's not America. It's not Liberia, which has got the same system as the United States. And the only other country offering the opportunity that Mr. Rees Mogg uh, uh, sees for perhaps reinvigorating pound shillings and pence and uh, stones and I can't even remember the other stuff. Um, the only country which offers the Brexit opportunity is Myanmar, <laughs> which is a military dictatorship. So we could actually have better trade with the military dictators in Myanmar as we have a similar political system to the military <laughs> in Belarus, <laughs> which seems to be a fairly limited opportunity, but you know, I'm not Jacob Rees Mogg. Yes. Uh, Gavin, uh, you and I have similar artists, I say with due modesty. I'm also a Scot who has spent most of my life in England. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also proud to be British and proud to be European, as I believe you are, as you just said. One thing that's always puzzled me, as I say, at Scotland and in England, until Jane mentioned it just now, English nationalism, true English nationalism, doesn't seem to exist. There isn't the proudness to be English in the same way as you and I. And I wonder, uh, and it annoys me every time I watch uh, rugby matches on telly, that when they pray the national anthem for England, it's God Save the Queen, which is the United Kingdom national anthem. Can you explain to me why English, true English nationalism doesn't exist? Why is it because of the arrogance of Britain is England? Well, uh, I can give you a number of uh, answers for that. Yes, it is very odd. Uh, I watch the rugby too, uh, sometimes with more hope than <laughs> others. Uh, uh, well, part of it is the elision between Britishness and Englishness. If you're 84% of the population, uh, you possibly don't care, if what, you know, and uh, I, I love this great quote from Cecil Rhodes, right? Uh, I think it's 1898, something like that. He said, ask any man what he would rather be, and 99% of them around the world would say he'd rather be an Englishman. Mm -hmm. uh, even in 1898, if you tried that in a Glasgow pub, I don't think that would be the same answer. Um, but, the, but the elision, which, you know, is, is kind of natural. If you were the biggest part of the EU, you were going to think of it. Um, I think that's changed too. James Hawes, who's a, a fine historian and he's written the shortest history of England, I think it's called, it's well worth, well worth reading. One of the points he makes in the book is around the 1990s when um, devolution to Scotland and devolution to Wales were happening and Northern Ireland of course had its own parliament which was then revitalized in the late 1990s. You saw many more England flags than Union Jacks at England football matches. And that has continued to this day. So he, he is suggesting, and I think others suggest, that, that, that a kind of English nationalism has developed and there's not, nothing wrong with it. Um, the only thing I would say is, I, I, I try to think of it 
in slightly different terms, which is patriotism is what's good about us. You're patriotic because you think your country is great. I mean, uh, so you're patriotic because we'll think of all the great things about England, our culture, our, our, our literature, our, uh, and sometimes even the football team. And but nationalism can edge into something which is not about us, it's about them. It's about the people we don't like. And you see that edge still, for example, in, uh, in, in the Euros, the booing of the Danish national anthem, which I thought was very, very odd. Now, of course, of course, it's just a bit of football, perhaps, but, but it, 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 it elides in different ways, both Englishness and Britishness together, and also the good sense of all the great things about Scotland or England or Wales or Ireland or whatever it is, and also creating the sense of another that we don't like. Okay. Uh, Janet's got a question. Um, she would like to know your thoughts on what would happen if Sakia Starmer pushed for rejoining the single market and customs union. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. what would happen if Sakia Starmer pushed for joining the single market and the customs union? I mean, um, I don't know what uh, the dynamics within the Labour Party to begin with. I, I really don't know how, how that would work. But it does seem to me that um, we're already in a pre-election period. Let's not kid ourselves. If you heard Rishi Sunak today, he's gearing up either to become leader or to become, um, uh, or, or for the next election, or possibly both. Um, and in that election, I think it's, you cannot expect, I don't think, uh, the Labour Party or possibly anybody else to say, we will rejoin the European Union. But you can expect them to say, we will work towards a much more positive relationship with the European Union. And I don't think that even within, uh, you know, the Labour Party has different wings too, but I don't think even within the minority of quite vocal Brexiters within the Labour Party, that would be too controversial because our relationship with the U European Union is bedeviled by the nastiness that has been created by this current British government yeah, blaming yeah, the European yeah. Union for everything that we as a country have got wrong in reworking our relationship. So I don't know whether he would say, Keir Starmer, we should rejoin the single market customs union. But I do think if he said, we will have a much better relationship with the EU, he'd probably be on a vote winner. Thank you. I'm Alan English from the New England, not necessarily very proud of it, but when I lived in St. Albans in 2019, I voted for the Liberal Democrats, and I'm very happy to say they won the seat. And at the next election, now living in Canterbury, I look forward to voting for Labour, and I hope that Labour will retain the seat. And I'm not certain, by the way, I don't think Starmer's got any choice but to say what he's saying at the moment. But we know his heart's in the right place because that's what he was talking about before he became leader. Um, I don't think Labour's got a chance, unfortunately, in some respects, of winning an overall majority. I, but I think there is a chance of getting uh, a coalition of the opposition parties. Um, what are the chances, do we think, of doing a deal with Nicola Sturgeon, which would say, let us get PR introduced in parliamentary elections first. And once that's done, then you will have your referendum on Scottish independence. Because my concern about Scottish independence is, of course, living in England, that it condemns us to years of Boris Johnson or similar. <laughs> yes, I, I mean, there's a lot, lot in there. I don't, I don't know. I, I, in terms of, in terms of the SNP, I think, you know, there are all kinds of things that could be offered to them, including a degree of fiscal independence. You know, uh, you, one of the challenges I put in the book to all nationalists, including the SNP, is what do you mean by independence? What do you really mean by independence? Now, we had a definition from Alex Salmond in 2014, which was rejected narrowly by by the Scots. With Scots voters, uh, which was, uh, we will keep the Queen, keep the monarchy, we will keep the pound, <coughs> we will keep the Bank of England, and also there'll be a defence relationship. Now that's a pretty in inter, not everybody in the SNP likes when I say this, but it's a very interdependent kind of supposed independence. Now, it's, it's in other words, it's a long, I don't think that um, 
I know a lot of people in the SFP, I have great respect for them. They're not records. They don't want to, they're not going to just do, uh, have a Lord Frost who's going to say, well, we're just having this and we're going to take the ball and move away. They recognize they need a good relationship with England. And so somewhere between where we are now and some definition of independence, we're going to have to realize that we're always going to share the same island and that, that we will always actually have to work together. Um, always. There's, there, there's, there's no question of that. And I've never quite understood why that can't be made easier for everybody by perhaps giving, giving the SNP a, a little more and perhaps saying to, because I share your fear about England, which is if Scotland were to be in the bank, I'm fairly confident that they, and I've talked to quite a few people who know much more about the workings of the EU than I do, that Scotland would be able to join or rejoin the EU because the situation is not the Catalan problem before because it wouldn't be a member state breaking up and then a bit trying to rejoin. It would be a non-member state where a bit broke off in order to rejoin or to join the European Union. And that would leave England in a very peculiar position because you could imagine that from County Kerry to Poland, from Greece to Shetland, there would be a European Union of which England was not a part. And that was the kind of nightmare that Henry VIII <laughs> used to have, the idea that we are surrounded by foreign foes. So I think, I think it's very, I think almost anything along the lines that you're suggesting is possible. The big question is whether any electoral pact before an election would be possible. And I think that would be clearly very difficult for all of them. Um, Jackie has a question, and she would like to know how far would you agree with the proposition that Britain came out of Europe to protect the rich from tax plans that the EU had? Sorry, missed the last bit of that. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll read it out again. How far would you agree with the proposition that Britain came out of Europe to protect the rich from the tax plans that the EU had? Well, um, thank you. As lawyers would say, cui bono, who benefits? Who benefits from Brexit? Uh, where are the Brexit opportunities? I would say there have been Brexit opportunities for certain people who've been able to move their money outside the UK while still being UK citizens. And I'm, I'm thinking of Jacob Rees Mock. Uh, uh, there are benefits for uh, the Kremlin, who seem to uh, understand that the divisions in Britain are very useful to them and that anything that undermines the unity of the European Union is of use to them. Um, so if Jacob Rees-Mogg is looking for those Brexit benefits, he could find some perhaps uh, in Somerset Capital, which I believe is the name of this company, and also he could have a word with Mr. Putin. For the rest of us, I'm struggling to see the Brexit benefits. So I agree with a bit of that question. But other pe but people voted for Brexit for all kinds of reasons that's, that are slightly different from that. Yeah. So, don't be on with some of the questions and some of the people I have here. It's been a frustration of mine since kind of the last few years that uh, things like coronavirus, what's happening in Ukraine and the like are obscuring some of the um, downsides of Brexit and it's taking headlines away from yeah. the coverage. Um, with, with um, there being a core of people who are really for Bre uh, Brexit still existing, how do we move forward and how what sort of catalyst is there going to be to actually propel us back to Europe and actually bring some of those people with us and rejoin us as a country? Well, I, I, think, I think you're right that, I mean, you know, Napoleon used to ask if his generals were lucky because he thought, and, and I think Boris Johnson has been very lucky because he's had been mired in scandals of various sorts and his, his frankly laziness and incompetence has been obscured by the fact that we're all trying to recover from coronavirus. We're all now very worried about the economy and the, the cost of living and, and, you know, the increase in poverty and so on. And we're all worried about what Putin does next. So in that sense, he's been very lucky. And one of the things is uh, every day it's been a good day to bury bad news for Boris Johnson because of every day recently. Um, and those of us who, who live in Kent do understand that of 
Of course, there's dislocation at Dover because of PO, but there's a lot of dislocation that's nothing to do with PO. I know people who talk about who are importers and so on who talk about the added bureaucracy, the added costs, the fact they have to employ other people to fill in forms which they never had to do. We all know perhaps people who posted something to a friend in, in Europe or vice versa and find that there's a huge charge. So all of those things don't really make the news, but they still exist. And um, you know, in the end, I, I, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, co I'm optimistic that um, uh, we will have a much better relationship with the European Union in the near future, but I do think in the end facts matter. And simply to be told a lot of bluster about global Britain doesn't work. So, thank you. Um, just before I ask my question, I want to take you up on the fact that you just now said that if Scotland could join the EU, uh, England would be surrounded, your words were, by foreign foes. I think that's dangerous language and not really good language. No, I, 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 I no more be surrounded by foreign foes than, say, Switzerland. This is no, it's no, I, I, I'm, merely, I, I'm merely using the language that will be used by, as you know exactly, who was used as that, 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 that phrase. And it was, of course, the phrase that it was, of course, the sentiment of Henry VIII. And that's that's the real real point. If Brexit means instead of taking our country back, the diminution of our country <coughs> across the world, uh, the loss of status within Europe, the loss really of our strength with the Americans, and if Scotland were to join the European Union and Ireland were to be reunited the situation for England would be to be surrounded by people who are part of an alliance that England would not be part of and it would be seen exactly as, as foreign foes and it would be very psychologically very psychologically damaging to exactly the same people who voted for Brexit in the first place that's why I use the phrase but, but you had a question as well. Um, in England we tend to think about um, the Scots um, in a rather friendly way, possibly a slightly patronising way, but we sort of think of them as an endearing lot, or we think of the Welsh and their leeks and their daffodils and so on. And it's quite a tender, affectionate, rather warm feeling. Would you say that the um, ordinary Scottish person does not feel that way towards the English, or do you think they do? I think I think things have changed greatly over the past 30 years, actually. I think one of the benefits of devolution for Scotland has been a sense of control of Scots, so people having control of their own affairs. And if you watch the television news in Scotland, all the things that really matter to you in your daily life, uh, uh, the education of your kids, your health service, uh, the legal system, and so on, they're all devolved, all devolved. Um, and the difference is, is quite striking because, for example, unlike the hostile environment to immigrants, that mm -hmm. Theresa May uh, talked about and sending these ludicrous bands around going, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you come over here and you haven't got the right paperwork, go home. I mean, who was that meant to impress? It was meant to impress uh, some voters in England. In Scotland, rather like Ireland, which has seen a decrease in their population over centuries, frankly, people moving to America and to, to the colonies, they have had a much more welcoming attitude towards migrants from all over, including England, I should say. In Glasgow, if you're a Glaswegian, I was born in Glasgow, if you're a Glaswegian, you're known as a Ouija, a Glaswegian. And when uh, there has, when uh, Nigel Farage, I thought I'd say the name quickly, um, <laughs> when Nigel Farage suggested uh, essentially that um, migrants were not welcome in this country, and that there was a very unfortunate um, matter of a, uh, a refugee who had mental health problems. I believe he stabbed somebody. Um, he, he said that this showed that basically any, anybody who came into this country undocumented was a, was a threat. Uh, the attitude in Glasgow was the posters went up saying, we call them refugees. Mm -hmm. meaning they're part of us. Now, I'm not saying there are no racists in Scotland, of course there are, and I'm not, certainly not saying there are no people who don't like England or English people. But the big change has been, because of the growing confidence about nationalism and so on, that it, the sense that we need people from England and elsewhere to come to Scotland has been expressed to me 
repeatedly by Scottish politicians. So that has changed. And curiously, the situation in Ireland is very similar to that in Scotland, a place where lots of people left and now much more welcoming to migrants than, um, than in the past. And the same attitude to England, which was an attitude of hostility during the troubles sometimes by some people, that has changed too. And again, it's not perfect, it's not everybody, but it has changed. I think. Although quoting Cecil Rhodes in the last yeah. part would still lead to problems. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You remember the war cry, give us back our laws. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no point in my, my little story. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't, that, that's what Rick Sotiers was saying. Give us back our, our laws. Our laws. Okay. No, I, I, I don't know that. I do know that I was in Rye in Sussex, where uh, a gentleman who was a very strong Brexiteer said that he was so glad that we left the European Union because it meant all these impositions of European laws upon us, which had ruined our country, were now gone. And I said, which ones most ruined things for you? And he said, well, nothing entirely springs to mind. <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> I think he was um, a bit misled. Any more? John, I've got a question for us. I, 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 I think I'm probably being a bit romantic, but earlier on you talked about leadership and you quoted Greenwood. Uh, and seems to me that that's perhaps the key problem, but it's not just in, in, in these islands, because what you said earlier about the problems we face, COVID, global, uh, warming, climate change, global, uh, other health problems, global, uh, economic problems, global, and yet, we don't have leaders who are getting people to think beyond the flag, to think outside the national identity, to think that we share with people in other countries all these issues. And unless we work together, we aren't going to solve them. And it's you know, actually dead. But for our young, these are the key issues. And I, I think that, that that's what worries me a little bit about all the flag waving and even talking about, you know, Scotland and Wales and Ireland and England, because in a sense they're irrelevant to what we face globally. And that's where, you know, I think that, that our identity ought to be our humanity. I know that sounds terribly romantic and, and, and absurd, but I, 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 I yearn to hear a politician talking about these things and stretching us beyond the sort of narrow confines of these islands and even in, in Europe. I mean, the great thing about Europe was we were beginning to transcend and people were beginning to think of themselves as Europeans rather than, you know, French or German or whatever. So I think that's what I, I'm very worried about. But the other thing that I, I feel that is very frightening is that we are in the world of manipulation now. And if you, I and mean, if I keep on quoting, because everybody be bored about this, the book by Zuboff on surveillance capitalism, which illustrates, and Cummings illustrated, that, that the ability to get so much personal data to manipulate people is enormous now. So there are the two things which are at war with one another, I think. You know, the sort of individualism uh, coming from sort of surveillance capitalism, and then these global issues which we, we're not having. <coughs> Sorry, I shouldn't. It's, it's yeah, your, yeah, no, very good. No, I think I agree with a lot of that. I, I think I just, I know they were coming to an end, but uh, I, I would say this is, let me advance a, a theory to you and see if it, it, it goes out well. I think we are in an age of the politics of distraction. We're not in the age of people thinking strategically about where they want to go to, nor are we in an age of, um, of ideologies. Putin's great um, attributes, uh, it seems to me, are that he has a lot of money 
and he doesn't have an ideology, but he has a style. And the style is that nobody in Russia really knows what the truth actually is, because they're bombarded with competing, competing views. And Trump didn't have an ideology, but he also had a style. And that was ultimately the politics of distraction. He could distract the entire world with 280 characters on Twitter. It's all suddenly, or the media would suddenly have a, a new conversation from Trump. And we are in a sort of similar position. We get announcements of plans. We have planned tunnels to Northern Ireland or a bridge to Northern <laughs> Ireland. We have plans for an airport in the, you know, that Thames estuary off Whistable somewhere. Mm. We had plans for, I can't remember what else, with the Garden Bridge, 53 million pounds <laughs> of euro money in line, uh, wasted. Uh, and these plans, plans for 40 new hospitals, and it turns out to be a few bricks at the end of a ward. What do these plans do? What links all those together? It sets the agenda for the next 24 hours. It's not what we're gonna do for the next 24 years, or the next five years, or the next two years. It is just, a way of cutting through the blizzard of information that we are surrounded by. And some politicians are very effective at it. Dominic Cummings is very effective at it. The Brexit bus lie, it was a classic lie. A classic lie, but we all talked about it. And that's the sort of thing that unfortunately has affected, infected populist politics across the world. And that to me is the ultimately a big danger. Anyway, maybe that's another book. <laughs> I think we're, about done. Yeah. Um, I'll just say a very quick thank you very much, uh, Gavin, for a very interesting evening, um, answering as many questions as possible. I think there probably would be a lot more questions. I certainly was writing down about six or seven there, uh, but we'd love you to come again, I think, at some point, perhaps in a year, as you are so local and as you are in the constituencies <coughs> of East Kent European Movement. So uh, thank you very much for a very interesting evening. And um, can we give a round of applause to you? I'll just say thank you very much to everybody who is outside there across Britain uh, uh, for attending and we will be putting on some more events here at uh, from East Kent European Movement. So hope to see you again in the next few months. Thank you and goodbye from East Kent European Movement and Gavin Esther. And don't forget the book. Yeah, the book. Exactly, if there is a book. <laughs> and those here, please do purchase one. And Gavin will be there to sign some copies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.